So um, I don't know how long this morning is going to go. I'm hoping it's um, not going to go the full time just because. And um, let's get started. Before we do, any questions about what's going to happen today in clinic? Who's the clinic, cor uh, clinic uh, assistant? Me, it's me. Um, I will hopefully get there early enough to get some gloves and, and iPads out. So the important thing for the clinic assistant is to, um, the radiology rooms are probably going to be set up as far as barriered. Um, so uh, make sure that there are uh, new barriers on the door handles and taking temperatures for the patients. So the patients need their temperatures taken and then uh, give them a slip of paper. Steph will give you some sticky notes or something that they can write the te their temperature on. So then they can bring that back to the clinician and they can record it in the medical history. So that'll be the first few minutes. And then you can go and um, greet, your, um, greet your other partner and patient. So your partner will be working solo for the first couple of minutes. Are there any questions with um, the clinic assistant duties or, or just how that works? The one on Monday is we have to get all set up and then Monday afternoon we have to all get set down, you know, tear everything down. So what we're deciding to do with radiology is um, you need to come to me to pick up a sensor and deliver the sensor back to me. The room will be set up when you go into the radiology room. The x-ray tube head is against the wall in the neutral position. That means the PID is facing where? Down. Down. Yes, the PID is always facing down because if there's an oil leak, that's where it's going to show up. You're going to see the drips on the floor. So that's why we want the, um, the, the PID facing down. So that's going to be when you walk into a room and you see the x-ray tube head against the wall with the uh, PID facing down. There's barriers on there. There's no guess whether or not the room was used. Okay, it's been turned around. If the PID is sitting around uh, and the tube head's in the middle of the, the floor um, or middle of the room, then it looks like um, it's just been used. So that's the rationale behind that. Um, and so you are responsible for turning the room around for the next person. And then you, uh, so if you're working with partners, your partner can um, seat the patient again, somebody turns the room around and then you go meet your, your patient again. Um, and then at the end of the day, you don't have to um, do anything with that. But um, again, Mondays we're setting up and we're tearing down. On Wednesdays, we're setting up the first clinic assistant and then the second clinic assistant in the afternoon uh, puts everything away. So Mondays are, Mondays are more hectic. Okay. So if we also, if we end up with another week in clinic, we will have to repeat clinic assistant duties at some point, okay? Because we have 27 students, we have 27 clinics. If we go to 31, we're repeating the alphabet. So if you were like Amanda, if we're starting with the W, she's probably gonna have another, um, another session at being clinic assistant. The nice thing is it's not interrupting clinic, um, clinic time. We used to have a dedicated clinic assistant that did not have clinic at all. They were just the clinic assistant. Oh, Amanda loved talking to all the people. Yeah, that's her, isn't it? Mm -mm -mm. Okay. <laughs> um, it is, it is, it's fun being clinic assistant. You're busy, you're running around. And when you're clinic assistant, you're managing the radiology area. Uh, Mariella is not going to have time to hang out in the radiology area. So that means you need to sign up on the book. This is something else I forgot to tell you. You sign up on the book and say what room or whatever. And then 
the person who uh, tears down the room can let the next person know on the list because we don't have anybody to say who's running next. Um, it, the radiology area is not going to be as crowded once we get more of the process of care underway. There's usually not an issue with that. Um, so it, since everybody was starting a new patient at the same time, we were backed up a little bit, but it does ease up. Trust me, it does ease up. So if your radiology, if you wanted to take x-rays and you your rooms are full and you don't have a room, what else can you be doing while you're waiting? Perio charting. Perio charting, you're done with perio charting. What else can you be doing? Hard tissue charting. And then all you need to do is verify the hard tissue charting uh, with the radiographs. and. Uh, then you can get the bone level and fill in the rest of the template for perio charting once you get your radiographs. Uh, hard tissue needs to be done after perio as far as being checked with Dr. Vermuri. She will not do it before your perio. Uh, then if there's a long wait for your hard tissue, go ahead and disclose and start your OHI. It's fine to disclose beforehand. Dr. Bermuri just does not want to see a, a bunch of purple and pink. So if you're next on the list, wait. If you're four people down the list for hard tissue, go ahead and do your OHI. And, and then if that is done, you can go ahead and start your scaling for your quadrant. But it's important when you're at the scaling um, place to ask your instructor, how many teeth do you want me to do? Uh, if it's a one one or a child, we might say, go ahead and do two quadrants or an arch. We might tell you to do a sextant. We might advise you to do two teeth or one tooth. If there are four four, we're going to be doing it one tooth at a time or two teeth at a time because we only start what we can complete. Now with that, okay, let's get into the non-surgical periodontal therapy and adjunctive therapy. So we're going to talk about um, the non-surgical periotherapy today. And that is our gold standard, is our periodebridement or debridement, as we've talked about. Okay, For it's the initial therapy, we called it in perio-IP. Um, other offices will call it other things for your initial therapy before you decide what needs to be surgically treated. Sometimes patients will respond so favorably instead of just going in and cutting, for example, they always, the periodontist always wants them to have the initial therapy done first, not only to uh, act as a tissue conditioner, but to see how that patient's immune response is going to respond. So we have a really critical role in that then with your office, you're going to have to, especially if it's a general office, need to decide what's the cutoff point. Do you do those four quadrants and then refer, or do you determine the need for referral and go ahead and send them off? Um, each office has a slightly different philosophy, whether or not they, um, they want to do the initial therapy. From a periodontist standpoint, I can tell you that we always liked doing the initial prep because we wanted to see how the patient responded. If the general dentist does the four quadrants and then sends the patient, we don't know what that before was and how the patient responded. Plus, the other side of the coin is they've already used their insurance for their four quadrants of therapy, the four quadrants of scaling and root planing, which is what the insurance calls it, the 4341s. And they can only have that once every 18 months. And then you need to do it again and the patient's not happy. So um, it's finding out and having a relationship with your periodontist is really key for a lot of this. But what is non-surgical periotherapy? We want to disrupt the biofilm because that is the primary etiological factor. We want to remove biofilm through what we're doing, but it's important that the patient know how to do that on a continual daily basis. Otherwise, whatever we do, it's going to be so temporary. We're, we scale. 
we root plane, whether we use just hand instruments or uh, manual instruments or power driven, because of COVID, power driven instruments are um, have been um, put aside, but we have the advantage in our clinic that have uh, HVE, the high evacuation. So we can go ahead and use power driven instruments. So we want to remove as much of the deposits as we can, both supra as well as sub. Now bacterial um, debridement involves the elimination of bacterial toxins. And that's why we're not calling it root planing anymore because we're treating the entire pocket area. And um, we're trying to reverse that non-aerobic or anaerobic gram negative bacteria into a healthier state. And that's what the meeting tonight is going to be about, guys. If you can pop in to the, um, the lecture tonight, Bill Landers, oh my gosh, is um, he, he's just marvelous. And he's going to be talking about these uh, red complex uh, pathogens and how to really get to them. Because just because we remove the calculus, you have a six or an eight millimeter pocket what's that patient going to do to be able to disrupt that bacteria six to eight millimeters below the gum tissue? Brushing, flossing, water picking only gets about four millimeters, five. So we've got that no man's land that we have to take care of. Um, so non-surgical periotherapy consists of your periodebridement or debridement, that's what we do. And, um, <clears throat> what our outcomes are. We want to reduce the infection as well as the inflammation. We want to reduce pocket depths. That is by shrinkage of the tissue, the edematous tissue above the gum line. And we want to uh, be able to, um, no, the slides aren't moving. <laughs> I'm still on my, I'm still yakking. Okay, slides aren't moving. Um, we want to reduce the pocket depths as well by that long junctional epithelium. We want to increase our CAL. Okay, so CAL also, guys, should not be automatically in dentrix. If your CAL is automatically um, calculating them, have your instructor figure out between the two of you how to turn them off because we want you to have this to be so ingrained in you that you don't even have to think about it. Because when you're on the boards, when you're in the boards, you're going to have to manually, intellectually think about it and calculate it. Okay, we want this just to be ingrained in you. So we also want to think about the adjunctive agents that need to be used that are available at your disposal to um, be utilized for localized active periodontal infection that remains after your reevaluation of the non-surgical periotherapy. And that's where some of the debate comes in. And this is your perio reeval that you've heard us talk about. So we're gonna be getting into that a little bit more. So anyway, uh, long range success of treatment really depends on the control of what? What are we trying to control in the patient's mouth? Bacteria? Yeah, bacterial, the bacterial biofilm. All right, again, the primary etiological factor. All right, so the patient has to be able to do that on a daily basis. So even though your OHE seems to be taking forever, yes, we expect you to use disclosing solution each and every appointment after you get to that stage of the process of care when they come back, except if it's morning and afternoon, but when they come back, you are always disclosing, you are always reviewing your plaque index, where the patient's missing and refining their techniques. Because if, again, if they can't take care of things on a regular daily basis, whatever we do is just temporary. So, I'm trying to move the slide forward. Okay, everybody saw the slide go forward, yes? Yes. Movement, okay. Learning objectives, 
All right. Now, when you have an objective or a goal, this is for your self evaluations as well. Things have to be measurable. All right has to be measurable. So it's not just decreasing the plaque index. It would be decreasing the plaque index uh, by 10%, for example. So you want to, um, you know, and then devise your care plan accordingly. Describe changes, describe current evidence. So our objectives are more broad based, but again, things have to be me measurable for, for that particular piece of paper. All right, so non-surgical periodontal therapy. Those of you that have been in private practice, what has your office called it? The scaling and root planing. Any other words? Deep cleaning. Sorry. Deep cleaning, okay? And that's what the patients understand. I was told I need to do a deep cleaning. Let's talk about that. What does the patient think that is? The patient thinks you're going down to the base of the pocket and cleaning. What are we doing in general practice? What is every hygienist trying to do? Go down to the base of the pocket. So the deep cleaning really is, is um, minimizing the type of therapy that we're doing. And we're trying to elevate what language we're using to allow the patients to understand that this really is a non-surgical periodontal therapy. They're not coming in for a checkup, right? They're coming in for their perio maintenance or their routine care or, or what, whatever your office wants to call it, but it's not a cleaning and a checkup. We're doing more than cleaning. So we're going to be learning um, and reviewing techniques Okay, and this is a lot of review. So the first part of the chapter isn't going to um, be hard at all, all right? Because hopefully it's all review. <clears throat> Excuse me. I know I'm not making much sense right now. So what are our expected outcomes, okay? We want to interrupt or arrest the progress of disease. Are we doing primary, secondary, or tertiary treatment, All right? So we're doing this with everybody. We're interrupting or arresting the progress of disease. We're trying to create an environment to encourage healing and resolution of the inflammation, all right? That is by the disruption and arresting uh, <clears throat> various toothbrushing techniques. Are you gonna be using the bass or the Stillman's or the charters or the modified bass or modified Stillman's? You are trying to customize your OHE for that particular patient. And we're trying to induce positive changes in the quality and quantity of that subgingival bacterial flora. And remember, we always have said what happens on top of the gums has a direct effect on what's going on below the gum line area. So we want to um, really help the patient as much as we can and reinforce, reinforce, reinforce. So again, OHE, OHI, education, instructions is where we are at. And if, um, if we're doing it right, the patient is never going home with a clean toothbrush in their packet, their bag that hasn't been used on them because we need to see what they're doing. We need to uh, refine their techniques and we need to see how they are doing with that refinement of techniques. Okay, so the IP, initial preparation. That's what we called it. So we are doing the initial preparation for surgical therapy. Does it need to be all four quadrants in every tooth? Does it need to be localized? And every appointment we are educating and motivating the patient. 
So we've got different patients coming in and with different patients, we have different goals. We have our, um, hopefully our typical patient, which is a patient with plaque or dental biofilm induced gingivitis, right? No bone loss. Then we've got our patients with apical migration of that junctional epithelium. Mild to moderate periodontitis is that AAP stage one or stage two. Then you've got your patients that do have that moderate to severe periodontitis, and those are the stage three or stage four, or patients with a poor response to the initial or maintenance therapy. Now, what do we call patients with poor response? That's the refractory in the old AAP, it's refractory. They're just not responding. They're doing whatever we're telling them to do. They've got great technique. We've done things to the best of our ability, but something is not responding adequately. Then we're determining patients who require surgical or other advanced periodontal therapy. All right, so all of these treatment goals have, um, have different treatment plans for them. So we've got our preventive services. What would preventive services be? Sealants, fluoride. Yes, and, and personal counseling too uh, for systemic conditions as well. Are they pregnant and more susceptible to pregnancy gingivitis? All right, so they might have not have the uh, P. gingivalis, they might have the um, P. intermedia bacteria in their mouth, okay? We, uh, they might have increased risk for cardiovascular disease. They might have high blood pressure. They might be diabetic. So we wanna make sure that things are stable. Those, those are preventive services that we are providing. So that's why you have to go through the rigors of nutritional counseling and, and all the other stuff that just seems like you're never gonna get through, but you will get through what I promise. Um, daily biofilm uh, removal is next. Okay, so preventive is, is fluoride. You're getting rid of the um, plaque retentive surfaces, excuse me. You're desensitizing teeth possibly before you even start scaling. So you can use instruments on certain teeth if they have hypersensitive root surfaces. If they're smoking, can you go through a smoking cessation um, appointment with them. You need to do one smoking cessation skill evaluation before you get out of here. Okay, so by the time you graduate, there's no time limit on that. Because we know that smokers aren't going to respond favorably. So all of those are considered preventive services. And that's where those human needs comes in. Um, some schools make you do that human needs after uh, your perio assessment before you do a treatment plan. And we tried it and it just took an entire extra appointment. So um, we're only having you do it on your test patients. Speaking of test patients, if you have a, um, if your first patients that are coming in is a 1-1 one, one or a 1-2 one, or a 2-2, two, two, um, make them, a, just declare them a test patient. Okay, or we will declare it for you. And all that means is you're gonna to have to do the um, paperwork on them again, your self-assessments, all right? But you need to declare two test patients, get all of that stuff out of the way as soon as you can. And then if you have a patient that comes in that's more appropriate for a test patient, we'll just cross out the test patient and make the other one a test patient, but declare them, okay? Have that done. So, those are the preventive services, services, all right? Then we've got our uh, dental biofilm removal. Again, this is what we are experts in. Gingival inflammation and periodontal destruct, um, destruction, again, results in the byproduct of those pathogenic microorganisms. They produce endotoxins. You've got your lipopolysaccharides or endotoxins that again are derived from the cell walls, from the gram-negative bacteria, gram-negative anaerobic, again, are the bad guys, and which are the worst of the bad guys? 
the red complex are the worst of the bad guys. So those endotoxins exist in the biofilm and really can be removed uh, easily from the parts of the teeth and tissues that the patient can reach with the toothbrush, with the dental floss, with interdental brushes, with water picks or water flossers. It's, they're easily removed as providing they don't have the pocketing. We are looking at the cementum and the cementum is thin, as you know, and it is very thin at the CEJ. It's the thinnest there. So we want to be very careful when we're instrumenting the tooth um, structure and having the patient do a complete removal of um, biofilm around that area because cementum is rough. It's rougher than enamel. So if they have exposed CEJs, then uh, they might need to spend more time along the cervical area. And we are removing calculus. When we remove calculus on cementum, we are always removing a little bit of cementum. So we don't want to over instrument. That's where sharp instruments really come in because we want to get in and get out as fast as possible. We are no longer removing all that, what we considered necrotic cementum to a glass-like surface. That was the philosophy in the 70s. When I went to school, we wanted to remove all of that and make it a glass-like surface. Now we're just trying to remove the calculus and make the root surface smooth, okay, of calculus, but not necessarily that glass-like because nothing can stick when it's, when it's so smooth, okay? Those desmosomes and hemidesmosomes aren't gonna be able to get that long junctional epithelium uh, at the base of the pocket to stick to anything. So calculus is not the primary etiological factor. It's not directly the cause of gingival inflammation, but it's a um, partial cause, all right? It's got an irregular surface. It's got an irregular hard porous surface that can trap bacteria from the biofilm into the calculus. So all calculus has biofilm on it, bacteria on it all calculus. You can't sterilize it. So we need to do the best we can in removing that calculus. And we want to remove the plaque retentive factors as well. So we're looking for um, overhanging restorations. We are looking for areas of um, places that the patient is really having a hard time reaching. What can we devise or how can we help that patient reach the, um, these areas? Do we need to get a specialty toothbrush, an end tuft brush out, something like that? Do they need a water pit? Do, what, what else do they need? So our care plan really needs to be customized. Even though we've got the same outcome goals for each patient, each patient's presenting with us, to us in a different state. And yes, we've got our templates where if they're a perio stage three, we're going to be doing A, B, C, D. So that's where you as the hygienist will come in as a um, team builder and especially if you've got offices with multiple hygienists, it's important that everybody's on the same page with different patient types. So you're um, in agreement with what treatment is being suggested for the patient because you don't want to get a patient on um, that somebody else's treatment plan and, and just disagree with that treatment plan. So the care plan components, management of modifiable risk factors. Tell me a modifiable risk factor. Is smoking. One. All right, smoking, modifiable. Obesity is now a risk factor for periodontal disease, getting your weight under control. 
it's a struggle. I know smoking isn't good for me, but I've tried to stop a thousand times. I know my steak and cheese subs are bad for me, and I've tried to stop a thousand times. I know those potato chips are bad for me. Okay, so um, diabetes too uh, needs to be uh, under control. You need to have a correct periodontal diagnosis. And for that, you need to have a thorough assessment. That thorough assessment is not just spot probing as many offices do. They do a spot probing. They'll put, you know, the first molars and the, the anteriors and the, you know, they just do more of a screening. And it's not just probing the pocket depths. You have to know where that attachment is. Is there recession? What is their CAL? Are there mucogingival defects? Periodontal diagnosis. Now we collect all the data we come up with a preliminary diagnosis. Our dental hygiene diagnosis has the stage and all of the other categories in it. But our dental hygiene diagnosis states as evidenced by, okay, um, generalized um, clinical attachment loss, moderate bone loss, angular, horizontal. We're, we're putting in the description, okay? And that saves us from the periodontal diagnosis. Some offices want you to have the diagnosis. My office did. I had no problems with it because that's what we are educated for. We're just not legally allowed to make the diagnosis. What's the treatment sequence? What kind, type of patient do you have? What type of appointment scheduling do you have? Do you have flexibility to bring a patient in for an hour and a half versus one hour? What is their fee service? One office I was in, charge per quadrant therapy, all right? So if I was able to do two quadrants in an hour and a half, they were charging the same thing as a patient I was bringing in where I needed two complete hours in and two separate appointments. So I um, had to come up with a different plan because if I can complete two quadrants in an hour and a half, they're not as bad as somebody I need a whole hour for a quadrant on. Right? There, I don't need to do as much um, intensive work from my end. So we came up with a different fee schedule for that. If I could do two quads in an hour and a half, this was the fee schedule. If I needed one hour per quadrant, they had a different fee schedule because you as the hygienist are going to be needing to produce a certain amount of money to keep your department floating. and. Uh, we always have to remember, unfortunately, that we're not there just to treat the patients, which is our primary goal, but the dentist has a business to run and we want the fees to reflect the services that we are, um, we are rendering. So I always felt guilty for charging for two quadrants if I could see the patient for an hour and a half. I felt guilty about it. So you need to have an open dialogue. What's the treatment sequence? Some hygienists want to save those mandibular anteriors for the last appointment. Because once those teeth are clean, they think they're good and they're out of there. You don't do a gross scaling anymore. You don't go around and do that circuit scaling where you're going around and doing all the teeth with the ultrasonic each time. And you're just going around and around and around for four appointments. The patient's thinking that you're doing the same thing at each appointment. So it's important that you sequence your treatment and educate the um, patient to what you're doing. Yes, I might be going around the whole mouth with my ultrasonic, but I'm not removing calculus. The goal is to remove the biofilm on the other quadrants that you're not working on and to go back on the quadrants that you were have worked on to just, again, disrupt that biofilm to encourage that healthier type of bacteria. So that treatment sequence is going to determine that length and number of appointments. Does your office have time to bring the patient back? I've worked in general practices where I've needed patients back for four quadrants and guess what? It's taken six months to get them through the four quadrants. Well, that's not doing them any good either. So you need to take a look at your appointments. Do they block out 
times for those patients that need it. And plan for a reevaluation. This is also true in, um, in clinic. If you've got somebody with perio and you're doing your initial therapy on them, four to six to eight weeks later, you want to bring them back. You want to do a whole new assessment. Did it work? Did it not work? Is that three-month recare that you put in your treatment planning adequate? Did, or is there so much residual calculus left because they've had so much of it to begin with that you need to bring them in for a whole new start of recare? And sometimes you do. Three months is just too long. If they're a difficulty four, they've got calculus all over the place. Yes, you've got minus zero, minus zero, minus zero, or whatever on each quadrant. But I can tell you, there's still a lot of calculus there. There's still a lot of calculus there. And I've told patients where uh, I've, I've told them that you are not getting a thorough root planing at this time. They've had so much deposit. I need to bring you back for another series of scaling and root planings before I can consider yourself caught up. You didn't have your teeth cleaned for 20 years. I can't do this in four visits. I might need eight. I might need 16. Have them understand what's going on in their mouth. So what type of appointments do you need? Do they need to have shorter appointments or longer appointments? Can your patient stay for an all day Wednesday for you? Or do you, are they better off coming in the morning or the afternoon? Sometimes you only need the patient for, especially if it's a new patient and you know that they need to have a, um, a medical consult, you might only, and they've got radiographs, you might just book them for a half appointment and try and get somebody else in for the other half of the, of the clinic session. Use your time. How many teeth can you do at a time? Can you do a whole quadrant or is it a sextant? So there's something called full mouth disinfection. This was popular a long time ago. And guess what? It's getting popular again, just like water picks used to be popular. Then they go out of fashion. Well, now science is ruling what we're recommending for patients. Okay, so what is full mouth disinfection? Does anybody know? That is when you are taking the patient and doing all four quadrants in a very short period of time. The philosophy is if you fall down and on the street and you've got a huge area of abrasion with gravel in that abrasion, you're not just going to clean part of that abrasion to get all the gravel out of that wound. You want to debride and clean that entire wound to allow it to start healing. So the philosophy is you want to do the same thing in the mouth. So the patient comes in for a series of four quadrants of scaling and root planing, either for a whole day or two days. That depends on the type of anesthesia that they need. And it's quite grueling. It's grueling on you to do four quadrants, one right after the other. And it's grueling on the patient for just the time inside on the dental chair. All right, so the whole philosophy is you wanna get off as much of that calculus at once that you can, and then allow for healing. So you're not doing a gross scaling, you're doing definitive treatment, but you're doing it on the whole mouth. And that way you can um, try and disrupt all of that bacteria and turn all of that bacteria around instead of just concentrating on one area of the mouth. What's the limitation of that? The limitation is, again, you are fatigued as the clinic, the clinician, as well as um, it's very fatiguing on the patient, but you are creating such an extreme bacteremia for the patient, sometimes they end up with a fever and they might need to be placed on antibiotics. So you really need to pick and choose who you're doing that on. Now, some patients will want it. Let's do it and get it over with. 
and some patients won't. So is your patient ideal for this or not? Again, this is a philosophy of practice. You want to um, see what your office is recommending. But the full mouth disinfectant, it, disinfection is doing definitive non-surgical periotherapy all at once. Is it by quadrant? Is it by sextant? All right, so you're gonna be thinking about that. IP, okay, initial preparation. You're reviewing the patient's assessment record, all right? Sometimes um, you've done all the assessments, sometimes you haven't. There are times when the office with the new patient will do, uh, the dentist and the assistant will take the radiographs, will do the assessment and then come up with the treatment plan and you're seeing that patient blindly and uh, it takes more review, right? But you're reviewing the radiographic findings. Can you see calculus on the radiographs? How much calculus shows up on the radiographs? Do you remember? 40%. 45%, very good, yeah. Only 45%, less than half. So if you're seeing calculus on the radiograph, you're, you're knowing there's a lot more there than what you're seeing. Okay, so you're looking at those radiographs. You're looking at where that bone level is. Do they have horizontal bone loss? For um, Do they have vertical or angular bone loss? What's the topography of that bone? You can't necessarily see the soft tissue. They might have severe bone loss, but three millimeter pockets, or they might have that same amount of bone loss and six, seven millimeter pockets because the gingiva is still at the CEJ. So you're always reviewing. Does the patient need to be pre-medicated? Right. Always take a look, especially for your recare patients before you call them. If students, if second year students are giving you uh, one of their patients or if Steph is giving you a name, if it's an established patient in clinic, look them up before you call them. So you kind of have a feel for what were they the last time? What's their health status, their perio status? Do they need a medical consult? Provide pre-procedural antimicrobial rinses. Now we do that routinely. And now with COVID it's recommended. Uh, so offices are getting into it, but uh, pre-procedural antimicrobial rinses, again, it's for the aerosols that are being produced. We are sitting in that aerosol soup, patient after patient in uh, private practice, but it's also um, decreasing the amount of bacteria that's super gingival, okay, in the mouth. So um, it's less bacteremia for the patient. Does that patient need local anesthetic? Does the patient need topical anesthetic? If somebody's ooing and aahing during probing, you know they're going to need something. Studies have shown that if the patient is comfortable during the scaling process that you can get a more efficient end product. So we want the patient comfortable. You will be learning local anesthesia in the fall next year. We want you to be practicing that local anesthesia. So if a patient is sensitive, recommend it. We don't want you over treating the patient, but if the patient can benefit from local anesthesia, do it. We have it. We will watch you until the day you graduate and you will be very well um, capable and um, confident in your skills but the patient needs to be comfortable. Super gingival examination. You're starting that with your EOIO. Visual, then tactile. The tactile in private practice is when we are probing. We're not necessarily going and exploring each and every tooth, but while we're doing our perio assessment, that probe is very thin, so we are using that as our tactile. Subgingival, same thing, visual and tactile. What are we looking for subgingival calculus when we are using visual? What would tell us that they're subgingival? I'm sorry, what did you say? Like inflammation. 
Inflammation is, is a good sign, yes. Sometimes, um, especially if you've got health, 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 this is on your perio, uh, reeval, health, 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 and then a spot of inflammation and then health around it, then that area is probably having some residual calculus. You can sometimes see that subgingival calculus because it's a different color. It's dark, it's gray, it's black, it's a gray green depending because it's rough. So the lining of the gum tissue is, is ulcerated and the calculus is absorbing that hemoglobin from the inflammation. And so sometimes you can actually see around the gingival margin that subgingival calculus because it looks like they have pepper underneath their gum tissues. Sometimes you'll scale an area and they'll come back even a couple days later from a Monday to a Wednesday, for example, and you'll be able to see that black speck right at the gingival margin. It's great when the body responds. So you're, all of this is part of your initial um, assessment so you can formulate a strategy for instrumentation. Where is that calculus? Is it a spicule? Is it a ledge? Is it supra? Is it sub? Do you have furcations that you need to get into? So we're using our probes. This is a Williams marking, which has one, two, three. Then it's got another line at five and a, another line. At, so you've got five, so four doesn't have a line and six doesn't have a line. So you've got one, two, three, five, seven, eight, nine. So you need to know what probe you're using. <clears throat> and that's where it is really nice to have the same probe in every operatory for every patient. Because if you're using a different probe, you have to think about where is that line. And that's very difficult when you're doing a lot of subbing because everybody's got a different probe that they like. But look at how long these um, um, trunks are. All right, this tooth has a real long trunk. So before you get into a furcation, you can have a six, seven millimeter pocket. Versus here, a six millimeter pocket is definitely going to go into the trunk. Look at how, where this is. So where is that furcation on that particular tooth? Advanced instrumentation, woo -hoo. okay? It's not just scaling three millimeters. You need to know the anatomical considerations of where you're scaling. Where is that calculus? Where's the CEJ? What is the curvature of those roots? How far down do you need to get that instrument? Because that will determine also what instrument do you need to use? So this is super gingival. I could use a scaler for that. If this was a posterior tooth, what scaler would I use? It would be green, okay? You'd use a 204. All right, if it's an anterior tooth, you'd use your um, 533. All right, super gingival. You could also, if this was posterior, use your curette, your universal curette. You've got subgingival here, but the pocket isn't very deep. So this would be where you could use your yellow. All right, your universal curette, yellow, yellow, or yellow, red, your Barnhart's. You've got deeper pocketing. Can you get down that far with a universal or do you need your area specifics? How thick is that calculus? And that will also determine what to use. All right, so this is calculus that's just subgingival. You need a lot of tactile information for that. So this is all different types of calculus that you might be wanting to use different instruments for. Now, we all have our favorite instruments that we like that we 
have learned to adapt to a lot of different areas and uses because you can't have a hundred instruments in each of your packs. So you learn to use your Barnhart, for example, on all of these different types of calculus. And then you just might your, need your area specific if you're doing root planing or root debridement. Does this look familiar? This is shades of first semester, isn't it? So instrument selection and sequence. It's not only the sequence of, uh, are you using it on the maxillary right or the mandibular right, but sequence of that calculus removal. For hand instruments, your manual instruments, you are going to the base of the pocket and moving up coronally. For ultrasonic instrumentation, you are starting coronal and moving down. So that also is a sequence. Okay, what are you trying to remove, right? Your finger rest, how close can you be to the, um, to the tooth? Your adaptation, lateral pressure for your working stroke. Is it a little piece of calculus or is it a thick ledge? Are you on enamel or are you on root surface? If you're on root surface, you want to be careful of that lateral pressure. And this is where experience comes in. You want to go below the calculus, snap, okay, to break that calculus off. And you want to cover all the areas of that root surface. And that's called that channeling. But you need to make sure that you know the shape of the tooth. You've seen this picture before. All right, this is a first maxillary first premolar. Is this the mesial or the distal? Dead silence, it's the mesial, okay? This is the mesial of the maxillary first premolar. Remember, it's got that concavity underneath the contact and then the concavity that goes all the way up the root. You need to know that when you're scaling because otherwise, if you're just going straight across, you're missing the concavity, you're gouging the tissue, you're gouging the tissue. Look at the angle for that adaptation that you have to do with the toe of that curette in order to get into that concavity. So your oral anatomy education is going to come in on each and every tooth. You're not thinking about it. It's going to be just like driving eventually where you don't have to think about all these steps. You're just going to know. So channeling, that's what it's called where you start from the, the lowest area, the deepest area, and you come up and you're scaling one section of the tooth. You're scaling that to completion before you go on to the next area. There are specialized instruments that we will be helping you with um, for furcations and other areas. You've got your ultrasonic tips. You have a set of five of them. Uh, you have um, <clears throat> your triple bends, which are for heavier calculus and your perio instruments. What you, uh, your perio instruments are the thin periodontal tipped instruments. There are diamond coated ultrasonic tips, which I used to love when they first came out because they would just get in that percation. But guess what? That is like a cutting instrument. Ultrasonics were developed as a cutting tool. So you could really do damage to um, root surfaces in furcations with that diamond coated tip. So I've laid off of that. Then you've got plastic silicone or carbon composite tips that are for um, implants. Micro ultrasonics, which we're going to be getting into a little later. And look at this, you've got endoscopic assistant calculus detections an endoscope where you actually with one hand, you're using the scope to see what you're doing 
And with your other hand, your dominant hand, you're removing that calculus. So this is on a uh, monitor. So you can actually see where your instrument is. Has anybody used or been in an office that uses this with hygiene? I would love, love, love to get my hands on one of these. The problem is it's about $75 a patient for using the tips and everything. So the school can't afford it. But if you can see it, you can remove it. If you can see it, you can remove it. It's a very expensive tool. Debridement, okay, is air polishing, subgingival air polishing. We have these in the clinic. We can't use them because of COVID. But this is where uh, technology is sending us. We disclose the patient. We do our OHE. We go and we deplaque first. Now, this is like the Profijet that you've had. This is the next generation. It uses uh, a finer powder at a lower um, power, and you angle this subgingively. You're removing super gingival biofilm, but you're also angling this to get underneath the gum tissue. So you're detoxifying the root surface. It's great for around implants. Uh, the powder is so fine, it's not really good for a stain like the regular Profijet. This one's called the Hugh Freedy Handy. The Action, which is another name brand, is very popular. But the, the, we've got these, hopefully we'll be able to get them out of retirement and you can learn how to use them before you graduate. This is an endoscope. You're using two hands. When we started using the PureVax or high um, speed evacuation with ultrasonics a couple years ago, my students were hating me. Ms. D, nobody uses these in private practice, blah, blah, blah. And guess what? <clears throat> Everybody's using them now. So I was getting a lot of text messages saying, thank you. Okay, it's like, see, sometimes we do know what we're doing, but by doing the high speed evacuation, you are going to be very adept at using your non-dominant hand to be able to get into um, areas like that endoscopic camera. Pretty cool. Lasers. We have lasers that you will be learning. You'll be learning how to use them in um, dental materials this summer, and then you'll be using them on patients. Lasers, okay, is a laser light. That light actually destroys bacteria. The science is still being formulated about the efficacy of lasers but you take the laser light, you place it underneath the gum tissue and you shine that light underneath the gum onto that root surface. You're not touching the root surface and you're trying to kill the bacteria. That light and energy is killing the bacteria. It's not removing the bacteria, but it's killing it. We are allowed to do non-surgical subgingival periodontal disinfection with the laser. That is what we are legally allowed to do in Virginia. We can't cut tissue, okay? We're not doing it with what the dentists are using, but what we're doing is trying to sanitize the pocket area. And again, offices are getting lasers. Uh, they're charging their patients for it. And uh, whether it works or not, we need to see how the patient is going to respond. So what we do for some patients is, which is really cool if you, you know, if you've got somebody that needs to come in every three months, um, do half the mouth with laser therapy and put a rest in the minocycline and the other half the mouth. So you can compare which is working better for that patient. Everybody responds differently. Post-op instructions. In Canvas, there are post-op instructions for periodontal debridement. We 
print extra copies out. So when you're doing that quote unquote deep scaling or periodontal debridement in, uh, for your patient, you can give them a hand, um, hand them something where they don't have to remember everything you've said. All right, warm salt water rinses, avoid um, crunchy foods, avoid spicy foods, that type of thing. And the same post-op instructions for periodebridement will be given to your laser patients. Self-care, what do they need to do for self-care, right? If their gum tissues are gonna be very sore, they're going to have to take it easy. They might need to use a uh, extra soft toothbrush for a while. Do they need to be on Advil, ibuprofen, or Tylenol? for discomfort? Do they need to be rinsing with chlorhexidine or will Listerine, the phenol, okay, um, based or the um, essential oil based? What would be best for that patient? Again, we're doing biofilm management, okay? What does the patient do, okay? They need extra protein. They need extra vitamin C. They need a healthy diet. So that's where nutritional counseling may come in. Emergency management, when does the patient call? If the bleeding doesn't stop, okay? Call us if you notice that you have a pimple on your gum tissue, that hurts, call us. There, it's not uncommon to have a periodontal infection after scaling because we've left calculus there. We've woken up all of that bacteria. There's calculus there. They end up with a periodontal or lateral infection. When do they call? Then we want to bring the patient back for the clinical endpoints. Okay, we want a reevaluation. Six weeks is typical, four to six weeks, four to eight weeks, depending on your office. Let the tissues heal, give them time to respond, then you can reevaluate. You don't want to bring them in on a Monday to do perio, uh, perio debridement and reprobe that area on Wednesday. That junctional epithelium hasn't had time to turn over yet, so we don't want to be puncturing healing tissue. We want to debride the area with an ultrasonic, possibly to deplaque, but we're not interrupting that junctional epithelium. So what's the time frame? You might have to develop that in your office. You're doing a full periodontal examination. And at that point, you're establishing the continuing care integral. Does the patient, if they're looking good, maybe they're on a three month recare. Maybe they're on a two week, uh, I'm sorry, a two month recare. I've had patients come in as frequently as every four weeks to try and manage them. Again, it's individual for the patient. Will insurance cover a lot of this? No, they won't. Okay, I'm just going to, uh, let me go. Okay, we're gonna go in a little bit more. Do you need a break? Are you doing okay? I'm okay. I'm fine. Okay. If I don't hear anything, let's just keep on going. Um, okay. Gina's asking, she doesn't see the dental hygiene uh, record release form in the super forms. Uh, just the super form is the super form. Uh, so we might be calling it two different things. Um, there is a record release in there, you know, that these radiographs we take, we'll make copies for you. That's all part of that record release. Okay, so let's get into adjunctive therapy. We're going to have a, a whole chapter on this as well in perio. So there's a lot of um, interrelationship here. Systemic delivery of antibiotics. This also goes into pharmacology, all right? Systemic, do they need a systemic antibiotic? 
back in the 70s and early 80s uh, to the mid 80s, if I was seeing you for four quadrants of scaling and root planning, as we called it, I would put you on. I'd tell the doc I'd have the, the prescriptions already made for amoxicillin, broad spectrum, antibiotic, and metronidazole. All right, that kills that gram negative um, anaerobic bacteria. Automatically, everybody got it. Everybody got it because we were assuming that everybody had the same bacteria in their deep pockets. So let's put everybody on the same routine. It's not recommended anymore. And this is something that uh, tonight's uh, CE is going to be on too. Selection of antibiotics. What is going to be best for the patient? Systemic, lim uh, you know, for the limitations for systemic therapy, that antibiotic doesn't necessarily reach that gingival cravicular fluid. So I'm putting a patient on a systemic antibiotic. It's going all through the system, but is it really reaching where it needs to go? So systemic therapy is generally reserved for the reevaluation area. And with that, you want to also think about what antibiotic is best. Do they need DNA testing or some other testing to determine what specific antibiotic is being needed? We're getting very uh, detailed now. Systemic submicrobial doses of antibiotics. This is your thing called Periostat. It's a name brand. Okay, it's a systemic submicrobial dose that when you say submicrobial or some, I'm, I'm sorry, sub antimicrobial dose, it's not a true antibiotic. You're not taking that antibiotic at a dose where your um, infected finger is going to know about it. Okay, but there's a there's a specific dose that will get into the gingival sulcus and that gingival curricular fluid, all right? And it's not the high dose, all right? So systemic sub antimicrobial dose. Then you've got your local delivery antimicrobial agents. You're putting it in the pocket where it needs to go instead of the whole body, okay? So the, what are some of the advantages of a local delivery? What would some of the advantages be? Okay, let me tell you, some of the advantages is that you're putting the entire dose right where it needs to be. So it's not, um, it, it's, it's not going through the entire system. So you have also less of a chance of developing a uh, tolerance or an allergic reaction. It stays in the area and some of the limitations is that it only uh, stays in that area for about 10 days and then it dissipates. With the systemic sub antimicrobial dose, what that's being recommended is once you start that, you're on it for the rest of your life because you don't wanna wait for that uh, periodontal disease to reactivate, you want to keep them stable. And to keep them stable, you want to kill and manage that bacteria in the pocket. So the philosophy of that periostat is you are on it forever. Patients don't necessarily like that. So some of the limitations is that it needs to be redone, okay, time and time again. The studies are showing, depending on what medicament you're using, it can be used for up to three times before you really see results. So local delivery agents, we have some of them. We have Arrestin in the in, um, clinic that you'll be using. Uh, you can use it during therapy. You could use it at the re-evaluation as well. You can use them with recurrent disease, and you can also use it around peri-implantitis. Now, peri-implantitis, again, is that gingivitis around 
the implant. Perimucositis is um, the bone loss. The initial studies for the local delivery was done at the reevaluation appointment. Let's see what can heal by it on its own without um, shoving in anti antimicrobials underneath the gum tissue. Let's see what your body can do. Then we can um, logically place these antimicrobials where it needs to go. Well, the problem with, with that was that the insurance wasn't paying for the patient to come back for the reevaluation. They wouldn't pay for the arrest in at that reevaluation appointment. So we started placing it at the time of our uh, periodontal therapy. So the patients uh, would get coverage from it. Now the patient's medical insurance is also um, paying for this antimicrobial. So we're writing prescriptions for the patient to fill. They pick up the medicament and we place it. And it's a lower fee. So depending on your office. Minocycline hydrochloride. Minocycline hydrochloride, that's your arrestin. It has a handle here. It has disposable cartridges. And this yellow here is the arrestin. It is a powder. This goes underneath the gum tissue. You squirt this powder in, it gets uh, incorporated with the gingival cubicular fluid and turns into a gel. Very easy to do. I believe you have to do two of them in order to graduate. Most students will be getting 12, 13. We have the, we have the medicament if the patient needs it. Uh, we want you to be using it if we have it. Uh, we're fortunate enough to have a, a um, the, the company will supply a certain amount to the school for students to use. So we are more free to use it. Offices charge for this. They will charge $25 to $75 per site. So you have 12 sites. That's a lot of money. You have 20 sites. That's a lot of money. If you've got a lot of sites, you need to be scratching your head. If you're not the perio hygienist working at the periodontist, does this patient need to be referred or are you just supervising the perio? So after you place this, the patient can't brush that area. You don't want them flossing if it's interproximal for 10 days. You don't want this gel to all come out. Very easy to use. The hardest part is hooking this up. And sometimes you will uh, have to, with your um, forceps, squeeze this a little bit to thin it out because it's a round thing. But you pop it, poof, turns into a gel. Timed release. One cartridge per site. So if you've got the mesial lingual and the mesial uh, facial on a pocket of a molar, they want you to use two cartridges. Doxycycline Hyclate is another um, product that is very good. I've used this in perio. Uh, we didn't like it in private practice because it was too expensive. And if, again, you need to pick and choose where you're using it. Uh, this needs to be refrigerated. It has two systems. You've got a liquid and a powder and you take it out and you pump, 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 back and forth, you're mixing it. So you uh, mix it for about a hundred times. So you're talking to the patient, okay, with it. And then you're putting on a cannula that looks like a needle, but it's not, okay. This turns into a gel. You're bending it a little bit. And then this gel 
can get squirted underneath the gum tissue. Once this is mixed, you have to use it or throw it out. So if you've only got one or two areas that you need to treat, this is not the medicament of choice. This is great if you've got a lot of areas, all right? So we use this in perio. Uh, not so much in private practice. Once this squirts out, it sets up and it uh, sets up into a hard gel. So there's a little bit of a learning curve because when you take this cannula out, if you're not careful, that whole gel comes out with you. So you have to kind of learn how much to squirt in and have a wet gauze to, um, to put your finger, I'm putting my finger on the screen and you can't see me, but you put your finger on there to kind of hold it in place before you pull it out. Chlorhexidine gluconate. Okay, chlorhexidine is a mouth rinse. They also have it in a gel form called um, perio, let's see, perio chip. It used to be, again, a pain in the neck to use because it needed to be cold because the gel would, uh, at room temperature, would get too uh, wobbly and you wouldn't be and sticky and you wouldn't be able to place it underneath the gum tissue. Now they've changed it so it stays stiff, but you just use your cotton forceps, okay? And it looks like a little popcorn hull that you literally place underneath the gum tissue and it stays there and it slowly dissolves. Chlorhexidine is a wonderful product for bacterial cidal. It's non-antibiotic. So for patients that can't use a lot of antibiotics or that don't want to have an antibiotic, a perio chip is, um, is the thing of choice. The, um, this was very popular. This was one of the first ones to come out. Again, it needed to be refrigerated. Now it doesn't. So we are always documenting, documenting, documenting. We're always comparing, especially if the patient is coming in from one visit to the next visit over a series of appointments, you're disclosing each and every time you're comparing, is that plaque index getting any better? You're not only looking at the number, but when they want you to qualify that plaque index, is it dark, purple, thick? along the gingival margin, or is it light pink and, and, and just going interproximally? When did they brush? When did they floss last? If they didn't brush and floss that day at all, you're going to find a fair amount of biofilm. If they haven't flossed in three days, you're going to expect to see some darker color on there. So it's always nice to have the patient be able to brush before they sit down in the chair if, especially if they're your four o'clock appointment. So we're always explaining things to our patients as well. Okay, that's what we're going over today. What questions do you have? Yes, Atrodox, very good, Medina, good question. Atrodox is the, the one that you, you mix, all right? Arustin is the powder, the minocycline. Perio chip is the chlorhexidine chip. One of the first things that came out when I was a new graduate was uh, that was getting into anti -mic sub uh, uh, trying to control the bacteria subgingively is um, it was a tetracycline fiber and uh, Oral B had it and it was this long string. It looked kind of like um, uh, packing cord and you had to pack it underneath the gum tissue and you had to kind of crisscross it and snake it in. So the entire root surface and pocket was um, was covered and then the patient had to come back 10 days later to have it uh, removed. Luckily, we're not doing that anymore because guess what? 
generally we had to use it around number 15, disto buckle or something. It was a pain in the neck to use and to place. So we're going to have, uh, we're going to talk about these medicaments a little bit more in perio. Uh, you'll need to know more about it in perio, about, um, you know, cationic and all this other stuff. So um, we'll get into it in a little more depth. Ms. D? Yeah. Um, you mentioned with the atriodox, it's good when you're, when you have many areas to treat. And I can't remember if you said for the arrestin, is that specifically um, when there are just one or two areas or can you use that the same way? You, uh, it's not recommended to use the same way because you are using an antibiotic um, and you're charging per site. So if you're in general practice and you need 12 sites, um, just step back and see whether or not it, it's going to benefit the patient or um, would you uh, need to refer them. With laser therapy for 12 sites, I'd whip the, personally, I'd whip out the laser and just use the light. Mm, okay. Because you don't have that antibiotic. So we've got a lot of arsenal that we have to pick and choose what we think would be best for that particular patient and why. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, having said that, when we're talking about disinfecting, please um, know that when your patient comes back, give them some hand sanitizer to use when they sit down before they do your OHI and they're, they're gonna be putting their fingers in their mouth, give them some hand sanitizer uh, before, you know, for medical history update. They can, they can sanitize their hands before they touch the pad, um, signature pad. Give them hand sanitizer after they touch the signature pad if they want. We're trying to really cut down on the amount of uh, bacterial spread. So, pre-procedural mouth rinses, as well as pre-procedural hand rinses. Uh, some indication on when do you do the pre-procedural mouth rinse? Is it when they sit down or after your EOIO? What do you think? Does it matter? To me, it all depends on if that rinse is going to stain their tongue or their buccal mucosa a color. Because if it's staining green or blue, uh, the Pro Health, you, um, we stopped using the um, Oral B Pro Health because it would stain everything blue. All the soft tissue was blue. And then we try and do uh, an intraoral cancer exam and we couldn't, we can't see anything, it's blue. So that would depend, okay? But um, very much so before uh, perio assessment. Okay, so that's all I wanted to yak at you about. Uh, Hua is asking, is it okay to have the test at 9 a.m. from now on? Is that for this class? Yeah, I don't care. We can do a 9 a.m. 142 test. Do you want to make that policy? I'm fine with that. So Hua, you're, you're in charge of reminding me. <laughs> okay, just remind me. Um, and I'm good with that. We're here for you, we really are. Okay guys, that's all we're gonna talk about today. Um, I wish you a, a good rest of the morning. I will see you at school a little later on. Whoops, and with that, I'm getting out of here. <laughs>